The U.S. is one of the most wasteful nations on the planet. We make up 4% of the world's population but produce much of its waste. Building pioneer Dan Phillips is changing all that. Learn how his dream of sustainable living and recycling transforms neighborhoods, lives, and ultimately, our culture. Next on Living Smart. Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. Patricia Gross, welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Our guest, Dan Phillips, builds affordable houses from recycled materials. And in 2003, the Institute of Social Invention in London recognized his work as the most innovative housing in the world. Once you see his groundbreaking work, you'll understand why. Dan Phillips builds dreams with recycled materials. Okay, this kitchen counter uh, we made out of uh, slices of Osage orange. And there are uh, six different colors of tile in here. You don't notice it because of the macro designs that we've developed. Frame corners on the ceiling, they're frame samples from frame shops. And when they rotate their inventory, they just uh, throw those things away. This is a wine cork floor. What's nice about it is it gets everybody involved in the recycling process. But it's, uh, it feels like a Dr. Scholl's floor. It's, it's very comfortable. The windows in the front of the building are relish plates. They're vastly more successful as windows than covered with pickles. In 2003, the International Institute of Social Inventions granted him an award for the most innovative housing worldwide. His recycling education began when he was a child. We saved everything. We didn't throw anything away. If it was possibly useful, we used it. And that is uh, a legacy of my parents having gone through the Depression. And I made my first bicycle out of parts that I found out of the landfill. And going to the landfill was going like a, going to a candy store. It was wonderful fun because everything was free. Every structure Dan has ever built shows the originality, creativity, simplicity, and heart Dan brings to the project. Dan is a self-taught builder. His PhD is not in construction, but in dance. I wish I were just a little bit smarter at PowerPoint. That would be nice. In 1996, Dan and his wife of 35 years, who owned an antique restoration business, mortgaged their home and started the Phoenix Commotion. It was the idea of the bird that flew into the fire and then was resurrected from the ashes and came to new life. Nice metaphor for uh, restoring art and antiques, but also a nice metaphor for building out of recycled materials. And we build houses out of free salvage and recycled materials, and we target single mothers and low-income families, and we only hire unskilled laborers. And that in itself is also a commotion of the Phoenix, because you're rescuing human resources as well. This low-income housing initiative by Dan Phillips recently began collaborating with a model known as Bridget's Paradigm, and sponsored by Christ Church Cathedral in Houston. We have a homesteading program now, and this is the first in the country. And the idea is anybody can have a house. All they have to do is build it themselves. Move this out of the, way. the model builds Watch these yourself. homes under the paid guidance of a seasoned builder and mentor who does all the paperwork and frees the family to do the physical work of the building. And we slide this down. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Right Bridget's place sponsored the interim financing for this house. And the idea of the model is that the owner-builder builds his own house at minimum square footage allowed by law. And in this case, it was a, a single mother uh, of four who built her house. The house is 640 square feet, and her payments are $199 a month, taxes and insurance included, on a seven-year note. 
As a result, Paula, whose last home was a women's shelter, learned many aspects of construction. I actually started with the uh, foundation and worked all, all the way with framing the walls and insulation, wiring, plumbing. But with Dan step-by-step uh, we'll step sure. step showing me how to do it, so it all worked out. If you know that in your mind, that in your heart, that you built it, then your kids or your family also realizes that it means even more to you, so it helps you get through a lot of things better. Okay, Barry, yeah, go on that one corner there. Today, Dan also mentors Rachel and Barry, who are in the process of building the foundation for their own first home. 11 16, 54 and 11 16. Without a program like this, there's no way we would have been able to build our home out here. Financially, it just would have been, it's something that we never could have even attempted to do without the programs that, that we've been able to access. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. To be able to do what he does, Dan convinced the city of Huntsville to provide a warehouse to rescue usable building materials. For legal reasons, you can't get materials from a landfill, but you can arrange for those materials to go into a warehouse, which is what they did. We indeed are building whole houses out of what otherwise is headed to the landfill, which can amount to about 75% of the houses they build, and with a quality of materials that often enough are way beyond what the middle and upper class can afford. One of his most creative structures is a treehouse he's built for an artist. Brian Benfro will be the first to live in it. It's really hard to find a, a good workspace as an artist. You, know, you end up getting housed in garages, uh, sheds, any, any place you can find, you know, you'll throw a tarp over something to, just to be able to work in it. And uh, this is going to be a real treat to have an opportunity to have a, a nice studio space to work in. And Maybe if we did that uh, outside the window, or outside here, you could see it from the window up here as well. The treehouse itself is more of kind of just a, you know, a place to shower, use the restroom, cook, and sleep. And so it's, uh, it's a perfect space for, for me to be working in and living in. I saw a hawk here yesterday. They did? A big one. What do you do with 15,000 DVDs? Well, you know, there are a number of possibilities here. They're kind of cool just even as a yeah, let me unit, my... too. The possibility of repetition is intrinsic. When you look at the, the light in that, I know. Uh, you know, that could be a marvelous ceiling or uh, uh, wall covering, uh, windows. Who knows? What you do is experiment. Yeah, I could shave in that. <laughs> After building over a dozen successful structures in Huntsville, Dan wants his concept adopted all over the country. The next stop is Houston. We're in the fifth ward here, and behind me is what I believe used to be uh, a very large rice mill, one of the largest in Houston. The owner recently donated the land for future recycled homes. And there might well be room for 15, 20 houses. And if we conceive of this whole initiative as being something that anybody can do in any kind of a marketplace situation, the banks are on board, um, the real estate people are on board, the municipal infrastructure is on board, Everybody works together to make this work. And Dan hopes, as he's done in the past, to break with tradition, change the face of a once blighted neighborhood, and empower other communities to do the same. And I'm hoping, if I can plant that seed in every town across the country, for doing what they do in every third world country, and that's build shelter out of what's available, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Thank you so much, Dan, for joining us. Oh, Having you here is, is really Thank great. You. Now, you have a PhD in dance. You worked in intelligence in Germany for the U.S. government. You, uh, you were in the antique restoration business. And now this. What inspired you to do this? Well, everybody wants to be a builder. Uh, we put sheets over the dining table to make a tent and uh, build with blocks. And uh, a lot of people just get... Uh, derailed, and, and I never did. I always wanted to build. And That's so, interesting, even as a child, because you, you made your first bike. Now, how do you choose the people that you said it's low income, mainly single moms, but how do you choose them to, to, to provide, to, to teach them the skills to build their own home and, and to give them really tools to have a better life? Well, they're everywhere. Um, the, not 
people who are poor aren't necessarily uh, dumb. Um, they, they have to have enough wherewithal to lift a hammer and read a tape measure and have a work ethic, and they have to have uh, good credit or no credit, but not bad credit, mm -hmm. and a stable job. Uh, that doesn't account for everybody that's poor, but certainly it uh, makes in, inroads to 35 or 40 percent of them. And once you help them build their own homes, you teach them skills that they could use elsewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Plus, they know how to fix their own house. Right. Uh, if something goes wrong, then they, they know what went wrong because they did it themselves to begin with. I was going to ask you that about maintenance. What happens 10 years, 20 years down the line with a recycled home? They, it, all it's homes the same need as any maintenance, other. and right. they have to be fixed. And so they do that. That's, uh, that's part of the world of home ownership. Now, we see that you're trying to do this in Houston as well um, and, uh, and the rest of the country. What, what sort of resources do you need? How do you maintain a process like this in the long term? Well, it, part of it is through demonstration, uh, showing that it can be done. And the second part is through advocacy. Uh, and if you build an advocacy group in any area or region, then it'll just spring up all by itself. Uh, third world countries have been doing this for, for centuries. And so uh, we have to make sure that uh, the pre prevailing infrastructure in the area is going to allow that. In mm -hmm. Houston, uh, we're dealing with uh, the city of Houston uh, inspection department, building department, to find out what laws are in place that prevent recycling and mm -hmm. building from recycled materials, and relook at those and see if uh, we, we can't uh, get a new direction. Okay, so you have to, you'd have to do that all over the country to, to spread Absol this idea and this concept. Absolutely. Now, you make the homes energy efficient. Tell me how you do that. Lots of insulation, lots of insulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we uh, make sure that there's a lot of uh, thermal mass inside the insulated envelope because mm -hmm. that, that acts like a, a heat sink and it, it keeps uh, the temperature even. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Energy Star appliances, uh, very energy efficient uh, heating and air conditioning. Uh, give me examples of, you said insulation, give me examples of natural things you can do yourself for your own home. Oh gosh, uh, whenever your hot water heater craters, uh, don't replace it with a tank hot water heater, replace it with a tankless hot water heater. Mm -hmm. We don't leave our cars running all night in case we need them, but with our water heaters, that's what we're doing. Okay. A tankless water heater doesn't keep any water hot. Just whenever you turn on the hot water, you have hot water. And, and what's you... good insulation material, for example, natural? Uh, well, uh, insulation material is widely available. Uh, that's very carefully controlled because uh, there's a question of fire. Uh, but uh, low VOC or volatile organic compound, low VOC uh, and low formaldehyde insulation is available. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, insulation is widely available uh, and recycled in uh, insulation as well. If I'm a person who wants to build my own home, are there resources out there for me to learn how to build my own home? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. With recycled materials, I mean. Uh, well, uh, the first thing is, is you want to have the savvy for energy efficiency and uh, uh, responsibility for uh, um, an environmental imperative. Mm -hmm. And there's a website known as Building Science Corporation or buildingsciencecorporation.com. It's easy to read. Uh, it has uh, Jack's or Joe's 10 worst mistakes in building in the south and right, 10 right. worst mistakes <laughs> building in the north. And it's readable. Then a person needs carpentry skills. Right. Not tall to carpentry skills, but some. Uh, you have to know that uh, um, things have to be plumb and level. Can you actually learn that stuff? I mean, is it oh, difficult? Sure. Is it difficult to learn? No, or? Okay. not at all. In now, fact, most people already know it. You know, in our nation, we are having some problems with affordable housing. How did we get into this bind, do you think? Well, part of it, it starts, uh, it goes way back to the Industrial Revolution when we started uh, um, mechanizing everything and standardizing things to make it easier and quicker, uh, get uh, more product for the amount of energy invested. And uh, that that's provided layers, uh, cultural layers that go one on top of the other. And so now we're demanding uh, that we have certain kinds of things that aren't really necessary. They just grew out of this this centuries-long cultural layer. Give me an example. Of Drywall, things. for instance. Drywall. Sheetrock. Okay. Um, that's become the standard. Uh -huh. uh, it's a minimalist uh, material. And uh, we we just assume that drywall goes into a house. Well, there are lots of other alternatives 
to wall and ceiling coverings. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of alternatives to floor coverings. Like, give me examples of alternatives. Uh, wood, uh, old wood. wood. Okay. Um, <laughs> gosh, uh, CDs, uh, bottle caps, uh, <laughs> shards of glass and tile, uh -huh. uh, anything. And if you uh, recall that um, repetition creates pattern, it doesn't make any difference what these and those are. If you can repeat them, Right. If you have 100 of these, 100 of those, if you can repeat it, right. then you have the possibility of a pattern. So there is a downside to our industrial revolution that you see today. Absolutely. It's provided the, the finest quality of life that we've had that the planet has seen. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if things aren't standard, then they get thrown away. And uh, everything is so available and easy and cheap. If our toaster breaks... At, you know, we throw it away. 50 years ago, we would have had it fixed. But right. now, it's much easier to throw it away and get another one because they're cheap enough. Right. And that's happening in the building industry. And the problem with that is the planet can't su support those resources anymore. Why do you think we waste so much? Well, uh, we crave quick, convenient, easy, fast. And so it's just easier to throw something away than to fix it and reuse it. And really, uh, it's just as easy to fix and reclaim and reuse as it is to buy new in the building industry. And that's what I'm trying to and prove. So waste really is, is, is impacting affordable housing negatively. Absolutely, absolutely. And what should we do about it? Well, uh, we can encourage and educate uh, builders to be more responsible with materials. We can reclaim materials instead of... Uh, uh, destroying a ruined house, as in Hurricane Katrina, and take it to the landfill, let's deconstruct it and reclaim some of the usable building materials. And then uh, the materials are lower cost, mm -hmm. and they're just as good, if maybe not better, uh, than what you can buy these days. And so it's a responsible thing to do. Uh, do you think, I know one of the challenges you face is building codes. Are those necessary, and should they be changed doing what you're doing? Absolutely. Building codes are a necessary thing, and they're the product of decades of input by engineers, architects, builders, contractors, uh, tradesmen, to make uh, the process of building and the products uh, safe and hazard-free uh, mm -hmm. and healthy. Um, but the building codes uh, follow market-driven strategies, and so... As cultural layering gets thicker and thicker and thicker, then we have building codes that follow that. And indeed, really, we can go back to the simple way of life and still be just as happy, have wonderful designs, and a very healthy house. So we need to look into that. Yes. As, as a society. Now, you've traveled extensively, and, and you like to travel in the third world. And you've told me that in the third world, they use materials that are close to wherever they are, and they build with what's, ever, what's close. Yeah. Um, what can we learn from the third world? <laughs> they, they teach us how we used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, America was built on taking whatever was available and simply uh, building a house. Honey, we need a house. Okay, well, I'll go out there and get some materials. And we can do the same thing. But the stuff over there is a big trash heap, and we can go over to the trash heap and grab those and build a house. Uh, it's still possible. Uh, and it's being done all over the world in third world countries. But we've gotten so spoiled in our standardized strategies and uh, our cultural layering that we forget that those materials are absolutely at our fingertips and absolutely free. All we have to do is lean over and pick them up. So do you think that vanity plays a role in the mess we're in? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Humans are gregarious. Uh, they like to identify with uh, the social group that they want to be identified with, and so they do what that group does. And so if that group has... Uh, uh, lots of square footage, then that's what they do. And if they have a St. Augustine grass, then that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And so vanity exacerbates the whole problem. Okay. Now, aftermarket strategies, explain what that is. Uh, every, every industry has some kind of aftermarket strategy. The automobile industry has uh, salvage yards and uh, used car part uh, okay. outlets. But the building does, industry doesn't have that. Um, instead, what we do is throw away and buy new and we bulldoze houses rather than deconstruct them and reclaim the materials and that's the way uh, that's the way we're put together as a culture and we need to change that how can we change that though well we can encourage uh, 
uh, recycling among all the builders and contractors, and we can try to uh, gentrify icky and uh, uh, legitimize trash. Uh, and <laughs> restaurants are doing it, and most of the houses these days are bland and dull indeed. They're all geometric. Well, recycled materials suddenly gives you a whole world of interesting designs that are healthy and interesting uh, and have texture and we're absolutely free. What have you learned from the people that you've taught? I mean, uh, people would think icky when it's recycled materials, but, but you can actually be more creative. I've, I've noticed that you can actually be more creative when you're using that so-called icky material. Um, how do people respond when they say, hey, you know, I can do something with this broken tile? Oh, it's marvelous. It's, it's marvelous. When you see people do that and their eyes just light up, and that's buried in all of us. Um, with my workers, I say, now, I, I want some designs here. I don't want any skull and crossbones, and I don't want any drug-related things, but I want a design. But, Dan, I don't think I can do it. Do it. <laughs> and they come up with marvelous designs. If you put people on their own and get them into the living room with a pile of stuff, they create their own designs and discover a whole world of design that uh, architects try to do, but they're they're limited and their hands are tied because they have to compl they have to run everything through this complicated symbology, mm -hmm. uh, and so the aftermarket builder uh, doesn't have to do that. They can go well. This is fun. Let's let's do that here. Right. You're allowed to be creative. Yes. Now one of the challenges though is, is making a profit. I know your wife works uh, uh, part time to 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 keep up the family income coming, but. Uh, can you make a profit doing this? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, I, what I'm trying to do is prove that the average person could, or average builder could make a profit, or mm -hmm. make a reasonable living okay. building for the poor with recycled materials and hiring unskilled labor. Now, you don't hit a home run there. Uh, I'm not getting rich. No. And I probably uh, could make more money if I didn't want to play with design quite so much. But I want to show. You're having show. fun. I'm having fun. You're, and you're I want to show what can be done. Right. And so I... Uh, I come out ahead. Uh, I have to pay my bills, but uh, I'm not getting rich. Right. Now, what is homesteading? Homesteading means that you just simply build your own house. You say, you know, I'm this land is where I'm going to build my house. And that's what uh, people have done uh, in America for hundreds of years. But we've gotten away from that. And we can do that now again. Uh, with um, a, a paradigm known as, as Bridget's paradigm, whereby um, we decide, okay, this is a lot, and I'm going to build a house out of these free materials. They're available, and they're free, and it might look a little odd. Uh, it might, so, it's not going to ruin my day. I'm going to have a house. Mm -hmm. And anybody can do that. In Huntsville, it's working magnificently. And I want that idea to spread all over the country, because every every town has a crushing need for affordable housing. So there's such thing as urban homesteading. Say that again. There, there is such thing as urban homesteading. Well, there is now. Because yes. you created it. Absolutely. You like to spread that. Uh, when, where do you go from here? I mean, you are just one person. I mean, if we could clone you, we'd put one of Dan <laughs> Phillips all over the country. But how do you keep this process going? By, permanently. By advocacy, I speak on a regular basis uh, at sustainability uh, conferences and conventions, uh, schools of architecture, universities, um, uh, builders groups, uh, city infrastructures. I speak a lot uh, and try to uh, develop advocacy. Um, I get a lot of media attention. That's a good thing because I, I want this to, to spread. Um, and then by demonstration, uh, people are starting to go, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. I want a house like that. I, th I think I like that. I'm going to try that. And so then it spreads. How do the spreads. people change? The people that you've given this opportunity of owning their own home, they probably struggled all their lives one way or the other. How do they change <laughs> with you? For every change in the exterior landscape, there is a concomitant change in the interior landscape. Uh, one of these homesteaders wouldn't even look at me um, when this person talked, uh, looked at the floor, and, and now, large, big, fully vested as a human being, not to mention having a house and being vested economically and financially. How do you know you're living smart? Oh, gosh. Uh, we try. We try to develop strategies. Um, I know that I'm living smart when I save that pile of wine corks, when I save that pile of 
of, tra of trash that otherwise would go to the landfill. I, I save the tile, and I know I'm living smart when I show what you could do with chicken eggs or hickory nuts or shards of glass. Um, and I know that I'm living smart when I convince somebody to give this a try. Uh, and it happens. It doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it does. And then, gosh, lucky me, I've done it. Um, and I know I'm living smart when uh, occasionally I get access to the control room and I can mess with the dials a little bit. Well, thank you so much. It's great to oh, have this you has here. Been a we pleasure. really appreciate it. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. And you can learn more about Dan Phillips by going to our website, HoustonPBS.org slash Living Smart. There you'll also find a complete resource list and feel free to share your own views on building with recycled materials. You can call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. That's 713-743-8513. Or email livingsmart at houstonpbs.org. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a great week. Thank you. Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. For a transcript of this program, send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.